Our panel is leading through disruptions. Leading our panel of experts is Dawn Houghton. She has over 40 years of experience helping companies innovate and stay relevant. She's delivered billions of dollars in global new product innovations. Welcome, Dawn. Thanks, Jane. Okay, Dawn, theme number five is changing corporate culture. Is that even possible? Well, we're going to talk about that today. This is our fifth theme, and in our first four themes, we talked a lot of different things about how companies can survive and thrive in a disruptive market. And one of the most important ideas that kept coming up is that a culture must be a culture that values learning, innovation, and change. And so if a company doesn't do that, they're going to have to deal with cultural issues in order to make disruption happen. So that is what we're going to talk about in this theme. So tell us more about the panel that you led this discussion with. Well, we have a great, very active panel, quite diverse. We have people from all over the globe and uh, with a lot of experience, either hands-on working in disruption or analysts who are analyzing disruption or consultants who are advising on disruption. So we have a lot of different perspectives. We kind of cover all bases. So in your executive summary, you sort of allude to corporate culture helping or hurting innovation. It's almost like a catch-22, right? I mean, you want to keep your corporate culture. At the same time, you're trying to change your corporate culture. Well, exactly. Your corporate culture for these big traditional Fortune 500 companies, the corporate culture has helped get you to where you are today. So there's some good things about that culture. And uh you want to make sure that you are keeping the good things, the strong parts of the culture that got you to where you are, but then looking deeply at the culture for what people were calling toxic parts of the culture that need to be fixed. Now, we know changing culture is very, very hard to do, and we'll talk about some different role models who have been doing a good job with managing disruption and having a culture that supports that. And we'll also talk about some examples of doing it on a small basis and trying to use that as a catalyst for change. So the key points are going to be around keeping the best of a good culture to fuel a strong future. Changing culture is very hard and requires change management from the top. And, of course, culture is throughout, so we'll talk about that. And we need to learn from companies who have strong culture and can embrace disruption easily. So I guess that rolls us right into our key point number one, which you're saying keep the good stuff, right? Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as they used to say, right? You want to keep the good part of your culture as you're evolving that which needs to evolve, right? Right. And that's where we get into the the fact of the matter is that companies who are successful at disrupting have a strong culture conducive to disruption. We're more worried about the companies who are struggling, and our title is Leading Through Disruptions. Who are the companies who are struggling to do this, and how do they have to strengthen their culture to be able to do that? And you can see here Don is talking about, you know, don't change a culture unless it's flawed. You know, you really have to recognize that an organization's culture is enduring values and it's something that is very, very hard to change. So before you try to change something, make sure it is broken. So before we get deep into how we're going to change a culture, let's recognize that even bad cultures have good things in them, either that got them to where they are today, and some of those things can get them into the future. Sumant talks about, you know, when you think about the startup culture, a lot of times when we talk about disruption, we admire the small startup, fast-growing companies as being able to embrace disruption. And what he's pointing out here is eventually those companies are going to grow up and what they need to be thinking about now is how can they keep that entrepreneurial spirit even when the company you know, becomes a senior citizen or 50 plus or or Mm -hmm. whatever. And then Samita talks about, let's identify whether the entire company needs a cultural change. So this starts getting at this part about only fix the, the values that are broken, but also only fix the parts of the company that are broken. And she points out, you know, 80 to 85 percent of the money coming into the company is coming in because of the existing product lines 
which were created and thrived under the old culture. So when you think about changing the culture for disruption, let's remember that, you know, the majority of the company is still going to be running the old business. So maybe we just change some things in the part of that company that will be actually dealing directly with disruption. You know, Don, as you walk us through key point number two, you're reminding us that change is tough. Yes. Change is tough because culture is deeply rooted in companies. It's something you don't think about, but everybody knows is there. And when there is something cultural that's holding you back, it's very hard to make that change. And what companies need to do is they need to figure out what it is, and then they need to communicate how they're going to make those changes and have a process to do that. So Jacobs talks about, you know, having that passion and carrying that out so that everybody knows, here's our new vision, this is where we're going, and, you know, the whole company has that common purpose. Dumont points out the famous Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast, if the culture is there to prevent it. So he points out here that you actually have two battles that you have to fight. The first is you have to fight the disruptive market that's going on. And the second, you have to fight the internal cultural legacy that your company is dealing with. And without conquering that, you're not going to be able to conquer the external. And Michael points out, you know, while job one is to transform the culture from what it is to what it needs to be to outperform, the bad news is it takes forever and the CEO needs to have constant attention. He says, you you can't delegate this to the health and happiness department. We did have quite a few examples shared that were, you know, how with the health and happiness department, how one group like HR or talent is told to kind of fix the culture, but the CEO and the board of directors are still going, you know, to some faraway retreat and spending all sorts of money on the annual or quarterly meetings and this sort of thing. And that's not what the rest of the company is doing. So the need to practice and demonstrate through your behavior that you're making change is something that the employees all need to see in order for it to take root in the culture. Stay calm and change. I guess that leads us into key point number three, which is that change does take a while. It's a process, right? We can't rush it and we have to be patient with it. Right. And uh, it was interesting. We uh, highlight key takeaways and then people vote them up. And what's interesting is in this kind of category of change management, everybody had a list. So you can see there's three different lists here. (laughs) We don't need to go through each of the lists. But the point is that change management is a process. You need to do A, B, C, D, E. A couple of the things that are just across everybody's processes is to look at, you know, what needs to change? How are we going to change it? Once we know what we're going to change, we have a plan to do it. We carry it out. We demonstrate commitment by walking the walk. And then the employees either need to get on board or get out of the way. And that's one of the issues with culture change is, you know, there will be employees who've been around in a culture for a very long time who don't really like the idea of change, right? So some of the things that make change management so hard is that there is a lot of turnover in this process. Often change management is led by the new CEO. So the old CEO kind of ran the company into the ground or the company's suffering and a new CEO is brought in to institute change. So it's kind of like a fresh start, but it is something, it will take years. It's something that needs commitment. So Don, in key point number four, you're talking about some cultural role models. Tell us these stories. Yes, so we asked for examples of uh, companies who demonstrate cultures that are conducive to living in these disruptive times and companies that generally known for being disruptive. And a lot of examples came out. So Apple, Google, Zappos, and I have some around the side, Cisco, Domino's, empowering the lowest level people to make customer-based decisions, similar with Southwest, you know, changing low-cost airlines and 
than have being known for being kind of fun. Salesforce kind of having this ohana, I believe is a Hawaiian term, about being like a family. And Disney is, uh, you know, kind of a historically known to be a good culture and Amazon continually disruptive. Now, many of these also have people saying, you know, culture is not so great, but for sure, there are parts of that culture that are supporting disruption sort of behaviors and abilities. And that's something that like it with Rob is talking about Apple and Google, and he's saying disruption would be something the culture itself drives and thrives on. So looking at those cultures would be a way to look at your own and say, what can I adopt that they have? Another approach, Famita talked about, you know, you really only need to change 10 to 20% of the company because 80 plus percent of the company is the same old, same old. And Laureen talks here about the concept of beauty accelerators. She's in the beauty care business, but accelerators, catalysts, venture teams, innovation teams, and these kind of things, that there are companies who kind of incubate and start new businesses. And in big companies, you know, you can either buy the startup, bring a startup into your company, and then hope that those working with the startup will learn from them and that some of their values will start seeping in to the company. And you can do that either by buying startups or by seeding them with funding, you know, taking an equity stake. There's uh, just being close to these younger companies who are creating something new is a way for the old established companies to learn. And key point number five, it seems like there's a bit of a, of a war going on here, right? Traditional culture versus disruptive culture. Are they mutually exclusive or can they live harmoniously? Yeah. Well, actually, Dumont presented them as a point counterpoint. And I think when we go back, the whole premise of this theme is that traditional companies value consistency, predictability. They are about improving efficiency and process and productivity. And doing that makes them a stronger business. It lowers their costs. It improves their profitability. They've done the same thing for a very long time, and they should be able to do it better than anybody else. So that's what, let's say, the traditional Fortune 500 big company is dealing with. But disruptive cultures are very different. They're passionate. They're very customer-centric. They encourage creativity and innovation. They reward intelligent risk-taking. And they become very agile at doing things differently. And that's true across the entire organization. Falguni points out that, you know, when you think about corporate cultures, you can go into a culture and see what is kind of driving that culture. And when you think about the different types of cultures that companies have, some are just more conducive to dealing with disruption or driving with disruption than others. So, for example, a process-driven culture is not going to support disruption. Why? Because it's focused on optimizing the process that they already have. Whereas a client-focused company, somebody who's trying to provide better customer service or better solve problems, they have the best chance of disruption because if the customer is needing something bigger and better and that's disruptive, so be it. Because if we're in the business of meeting the customer needs, we're going to do whatever it takes to meet their needs. So that is conducive to disruption. He had two other types that he talked about. One is focuses on sales and financial, you know, totally on the quarter and what we're making. And that can be disruptive, can deal with disruption well if the disruption drives financial performance to be better. If disruption you know, requires significant investment, slows down growth and that kind of thing, then that kind of culture will squelch it. But if it's something that drives to better, especially short-term financial performance, then it will embrace it. And then the last one he listed was a personality cult type culture, like for example, a company that you know has a famous CEO or is run by, let's say, a family or that kind of thing. And in these cases, if one of the important personalities in the company, a key person, is the one who has the idea, it may be able to thrive. But if the idea is coming you know, from the masses and doesn't feel like it's one of the key leaders' ideas, 
then it will fail. So that one's kind of a dependent. <laughs> so your final key point here, key point six, is this issue of corporate maturity. Right. So in the last page, we talked about the difference between the traditional and the disruptive. And it's easy to kind of see that as the old companies and the new companies. And what we think about here is that, you know, when you think about it, companies grow up just like people, right? They're an infant and they're a teenager, then they're in their adulthood, then they mature, they grow old, you know, et cetera. And when you think about these big Fortune 500 companies, they go through these life cycle stages and cultures value different things at different stages. So when you're a young company, you're valuing growth. When you're an older company, you're valuing maybe productivity and profitability and these kind of things. And Don points out that, you know, if we think about over time in long-term history, everything that we're talking about, the great cultures of Apple and Google and how wonderful it is, he points out, well, you know, they're enjoying a once in a lifetime generation growth. They have proprietary protection because they're early in their innovation. And it'll be interesting to see what happens to these companies when they do grow up. Because when you think about it, the big companies in auto, or steel, or oil, or aircraft, pharmaceutical, these companies once were young too, and they were once hot disruptors in the market. The last point here, as a company matures even more so than a younger company, culture is very deeply rooted. And Jay says something that's kind of obvious, but important to remember that culture and values really are what is practiced every day by even the lowest level employee. It doesn't matter what is on the website or in the annual report or speeches by leadership. The workers take their cues from the leaders and culture is just what culture is. So that's what makes it hard to change. That's what makes it so important. So you have an interesting survey that you uh, did here with your panel. Tell me about this. Yes, this time we did an open-end survey. We said, okay, thinking about corporate cultures at big, established Fortune 500 companies, name one value or belief that might make it difficult for the company to survive and thrive in disruptive markets, and then say why. I highlighted a few things here, and you can kind of see some themes. You know, it's about valuing the status quo, the legacy, we know how it works. They're arrogant. They're valuing expertise. They have evidence that what they've done in the past is great. They're very resistant. They have an ineffective board. They don't trust that startups could help them or that they can learn from it. They lack an inquisitive mind. They value loyalty, the leadership not setting a good example of walking the talk, you know, doing what they, it is that they say they want to happen, having barriers to innovation, and then just being overconfident. Those are all the sort of things, the pride that companies have, the well-established sorts of companies is actually not serving them well in times of disruption. So tell us about your top three panel experts, this panel. Well, I say this every time and I'll say it again. We have a very active panel and we probably have 10 people who deserve to have their pictures on this page, but we have three right now. Sumant is a analyst, very knowledgeable, sharing lots of examples and stories. Jay is a business consultant who has some really good stories that he has shared. And Falguni is actually in corporate life now. So he's kind of living through change on the inside. So lots of great contributors, lots of great conversation on the board. Well, what can we look forward to in theme number six, Don? Well, in our next theme, we're going to go back and look at dealing with an issue that has come up through these themes, which is you never really know when the right time is to disrupt. So what we want to talk about is how do you look for predictors of disruption and leading indicators that might say disruption is imminent. All right. Well done, Don. I look forward to our next conversation. That's Don Houghton. She's over 40 years of experience helping companies innovate and stay relevant. She's delivered billions of dollars in global new product initiatives. And I look forward to our next talk, Don. We will talk again. Okay. Thanks, Gene.